This doesn't look like it would change the world, but the first transistor did just that. This replica is a bit larger than the original, but otherwise a pretty faithful representation. In 1947, Walter Bratton at Bell Labs fashioned it out of a plastic stand, a chunk of germanium, and a plastic triangle. On each side of the plastic triangle, there's gold foil. And then on top, there's a spring, which presses the apex of the triangle into the germanium. That's why it's called a point contact transistor. Now, here's what Bardeen and Bratton actually did with this device on December 23rd, 1947. They hooked up a microphone to the left side and then an oscilloscope to the right side. As they spoke into the microphone, they could see the voice signal being amplified. As Bratton wrote in his lab notebook, the circuit was actually spoken over and by switching the device in and out, a distinct gain in speech level could be heard and seen on the scope. Now, that amplification is still one of the main uses for a transistor. Think of your cell phone. It detects a low-powered signal from a cell tower and then its circuitry amplifies the signal until you can hear it. But how does this klutzy-looking contraption work its magic? The key lies in this chunk of semiconducting germanium. Recall there are three ways we can classify material in terms of their ability to conduct electricity. Conductors like metals that readily transport electricity with negative charge carriers, insulators which refuse to allow current to flow, and a third class which makes possible the transistor, semiconductors. As the name implies, they conduct better than insulators, but not as well as conductors. But more importantly, unlike metals, semiconductors have two different ways to conduct electricity, effectively negative and positive charge carriers. That property lies at the heart of a transistor. It allows an engineer to make a highly reliable device that allows current to flow in only one direction. We can do this by making a sandwich of the two types of semiconductors. Here, the negative charge carrier one on the left and the positive one on the right. This semiconductor sandwich allows electricity to flow, reverse the battery, and the current grinds to a halt. Other devices can do this, for example, vacuum tubes, but they had many parts, were unreliable, overheated, and were expensive to produce and likely impossible to miniaturize. This seems a simple thing, yet it lies at the heart of a microelectronics revolution. And it's the key to the Bratton and Bardeen transistor, in fact, to every transistor. It's best to first think of their device as two separate one-way current valves. At the center of each is that piece of germanium, which makes electrical contact with a piece of copper at its base. And at the top, a spring presses a thin piece of gold foil into the germanium. Right where the gold touches, there's a thin layer of the positive charge carrier semiconductor. Below that, the rest of the germanium is of the negative carrier type. Now, even though that top layer is very thin, I've exaggerated it here to make the operation of the transistor clear. On the left, we attach a small battery with its positive terminal connected to the top layer. This allows current to flow. On the right, we use a larger battery, but with its ends reversed. This creates a device where current doesn't flow. The magic happens when we put the two in contact. The current flows on the left, but because the distance between these gold contacts is less than two thousandths of an inch, the positive charge carriers in the thin layer are injected into or stolen by the right side. So now current flows there. The current on the right is controlled by that on the left. It seems that we've gone to great lengths to just make a tiny current flow. I mean, the current on the right isn't much bigger than on the left. But if we look carefully, we can see why this revolutionized the world we've created a signal amplifier. The key element is the battery. Recall that power is current times voltage. So if we use a small battery on the left and a large one on the right, we have a device that amplifies any fluctuations in the current on the left side. These fluctuations might be, for example, the output of the microphone that Bratton and Bardeen used on December 23rd, 1947. Western Electric Company manufactured these point contact transistors in 1951, but they found it difficult to make them reliable, some even showing sudden death. From a manufacturing viewpoint, these transistors have a fatal flaw. They're three-dimensional. As Bratton said, no good physicist likes to work with a complicated case if it can be reduced to one dimension. Within a year, Western Electric, Raytheon, RCA, and General Electric offered the Junction Transistor, a superb one-dimensional device. I'm Bill Hammack, The Engineer Guy.